not y'all, sorry. Uh, so we finished the other day talking about healthcare, where the money's coming from, where the money is going to, and I sort of went off on a little detour for a couple of minutes on the idea of get health insurance. Right. But, or be nice to your parents so you can stay on their health insurance until you're 26. Um, that's where I kind of ended up. Um, but I mentioned healthcare is one of the two fastest rising expenses here in the United States. The other one being college tuition. Uh, college tuition for you to go to tech compared to the tuition payments I paid when I went to tech. It's at least five times more to go to tech now, this tuition, than it was for me period ago. Um, and y'all know I'm young, right? So I ain't that old, so it ain't been that long ago. Here's like, maybe I'll agree with that. Okay, but why is healthcare costs going up so fast in the United States? In the United States, well, and to a certain extent in the world as a whole, well, right here, new technology, number one, all the new developments and stuff that they're coming up with, like MRIs and CAT scans, this kind of stuff, and the, what the laparoscopic surgery, and all that kind of stuff, that takes millions, 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 millions of dollars to come up with that stuff. And so, and the hospital sort of be, dude, this can help us save more lives. And they're like, dude, we kind of got to buy it. And so when they do go out and buy it, then, you know, they got to pass that cost on to the customer kind of thing. Um, but I mean, you just, you all don't realize how much better healthcare is now than even when I was y'all's age. When I was y'all's age, somebody had a heart attack, they got what was called the zipper. The chest was cracked. The sternum that connects the right side of the ribs to the left side of the ribs, they cut it, pry your ribs back to get in your heart, to chop up or cut open your heart, and start sewing things together. Nowadays, just a hole, maybe two little holes there, and they got their little things on the end of the thing, and then just is going in there, remote control, and teach. And you can have a procedure where they're fixing valves in your heart and be back to work in two days. Instead of when you got the zipper, you were out of work for months. So just and all that big time and money and expense to do it. Um, drugs, prescription drugs. I think we talked about that a little bit in the monopoly chapter. But it, it, how expensive it is to create a new drug is you know all the millions of dollars and all the millions of things that they try that fail. The things that they try that they got to go through several years worth of getting it approved by the FDA before they can let a human actually swallow it. All of that takes money, and so the costs get passed on. Malpractice insurance. If you go to the doctor and something goes wrong, what are you going to do? You go to the doctor and they're supposed to, I don't know, operate on one of your legs and they end up operating on the other one. What are you going to do? Them, right? You don't, and you can say, well, okay, I'm going to see you for a couple hundred dollars, a couple thousand dollars, million dollars, right? At least that's kind of what we do. That's what we do. And more and more people, you know, when something goes wrong, the doctor's fault, the nurse's fault, the equipment's fault, somebody, you know, if I don't come out completely healed, I'm suing somebody kind of thing. It's kind of the mentality, and so as these lawsuits hit, and they're you know, millions of dollars per loss, the way insurance works that we're going to get to slightly later. So we're going to get to slightly later. They look at two things. How much are we going to pay? Or what are the odds we're going to have to pay? And how much we're going to have to pay increases because just we're just suing more and more and more. And then, what are the odds that we have to pay? The insurance company is going to have to pay. That's going up because if something goes wrong, the people are more likely to sue. So, with all these lawsuits, that kind of stuff, doctors, just like y'all, got to have health insurance to avoid getting bankrupted by that one big expense if something goes wrong with your health. 
the doctors got to have insurance to keep going bankrupt if something goes wrong at one time that they're working on somebody else. I mean, they're operating. I mean, your doctor's fixing you. Even just a small little thing, you know, a doctor's working on your toe or something like that, and the power goes out in your doctor's office and they can't see and accidentally, like, I don't know, cut you. Somewhere other than that toe that they're operating on. What are you going to do? So, for what? It's not their fault that electricity went out. Yeah, it's their fault they didn't have a backup generator and they should have thought about it because it's like that situation where they're doing operating on people. So shame on the doctor, I'm assuming for half a million dollars. That's what you do, right? Welcome to America. So, the doctors are going to have malpractice insurance and those rates are going up, up, up every year. So, that and the fact that you've got to, the doctors have to get awarded for the eight years worth of medical school and all that kind of stuff. But that's sort of a consistent thing. Ooh, medical school, college tuition, right? The other fastest growing expense here in the United States, right? So the doctors are having to have pay more in student loans, that kind of stuff. So it's just all of these things are adding on to the costs for somebody to be a doctor and do the work. For somebody to be a nurse and do the work, those costs are getting higher, which shifts the supply back to the left. What happens when supply comes back to the left? You don't remember from week two as much your prices go up. And then as the population is getting older, that we talked about last time, the older people need more health care than y'all young bulletproof people do, right? So what ends up happening? Demand is shifting out to the right. And what happens when demand shift, shifts out to the right? Prices go up. So you got two things pushing price up at the same time. Supply is going back, demand is going up at the same time. So that was one of that nightmare scenario when we looked at when prices really end up skyrocketing. That's why it's the highest as this growing thing we've got going in our economy. And part of that increase in demand, well, it's not just because we're getting older, but it's also the second payer thing that we talked about the other day, the just uh, insurance because we have it. Insurance because the Affordable Health Care Act a few years ago kind of made your employers give it to you. And then the existence of Medicare and Medicaid and that kind of stuff. It was that story we talked about the other day about you cut yourself and it's going to cost you $20. No, you don't go to the doctor. You cut yourself and it ain't going to cost you anything. Yeah, maybe you're going to get it checked out. If y'all didn't have health insurance, how big of a pain would you be able to put up with before you go to the hospital? Y'all could put up with a massive amount of pain before going to the hospital. Or you would try. Y'all would work for college students. But there again, that increase in demand because of the existence of Medicare, Medicaid, and the insurance in general shifts demand to the right again, which increases prices yet again. And all of this increase in prices costs the government. Because as prices go up, they got to pay more to treat your grandparents that are on Medicare. They got to pay more to treat those people that graduated last year's class in high school that are on Medicaid. All right? And there they will be. Because you know that person is less than class. What kind of job are they going to end up with? I'm sorry. I'm a very mean people that's arguing with you. Um, so it's costing the government more because the amount of money they have to spend per person for the people on Medicare and Medicaid is going up. And then you add to the fact that, you know, we're getting more persons that are going to be qualifying for Medicaid, Medicare because they're turning 65. Costs the government a whole lot more money. Where should that government get that money from? Look in the mirror. Where's the government going to get the money to pay these expenses? You and I, taxpayers. Hey, y'all call suits, y'all ain't paying taxes yet, but guess what? It's going to happen. Taxes are going to, you're going to start paying them and they're going to go up at some point. Insurance companies, it's going to cost them more because they've got to pay more. So if they've got to pay more out when you get sick, what are they going to do? Charge more each month for the coverage. So, and what's that come down to? That's coming out of your pocket, right? Your insurance premiums have really skyrocketed. When I was y'all's age, I went and I tried to get, my, get, get a insurance policy for myself when I was out of work, not teaching school, like it's such a graduate school and all. 
and I got a policy that was like the premium was like hundred dollars a month. I kept it for a couple of years, but it went like a hundred. Maybe it was like seventy-five dollars a month the first year I had it. Then it jumped up to a hundred dollars a month the next year. Great day. And then it went up like 130 or something like that the next year, and I'm like, great day. And then I'm like, forget about it. Because I was in, I was in college, working in, I was in graduate school and working part time building houses, and I didn't want all my paycheck to be going for it, gas and insurance. So I risked it. But nowadays, you're going to be lucky for any of y'all to be able to get an insurance policy for if you went on your own because your parents don't like you anymore and they kick you out. And you decided to go get your own health insurance policy, you'd probably be paying for it five hundred dollars a month. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so, it ultimately, it's going to cost us as society higher premiums, higher taxes, higher copays. Remember that graph that I showed you the other day that was talking about what percentage of the GDP, what percentage of our nation's income is getting spent on health care? That's what I'm talking about. Where a bigger percentage of our paycheck is going to be going toward health care 10 years from now than it is now. Even if you say nothing. But the thing about insurance companies is they are for profit businesses. You're not exactly in good hands with all state and you know oh, they, they, they used to be a steel there, but uh, state I mean, you, you can take all of the slogans and turn them back on themselves. Nationwide ain't on your side, you're not in good hands with all state. They made to make a profit off of you. And how do they make a profit? The way they work, if they get money from y'all while you're healthy, and then they pay when you're sick. So what do they want? They want to get as much money as you can, just get the money from you as fast as they can, and they didn't want to pay out as slow as they can. And then they and they're hoping that the money that they're collecting from y'all is bigger than the money that they have to spend. And guess what? If the money that they're collecting from y'all is less than the money that they're paying out on y'all's behalf, what are they gonna do? Increase how much they're gonna charge you. Right. That's just what they do. They want to have more money come in. Unless money go out. So they'll speed things up. They'll make it so ridiculously easy for you to pay. They were trying, they, they, they don't do it this much anymore, but they used to do things like when you went and you got your paycheck, and when you went to the bank and you had to drive through the bank, you're cashing your paycheck and just all for direct deposit and that kind of stuff. While you were at the bank cashing your paycheck, you could have them automatically pay your health insurance. Just that convenient. If you write a check to pay your health insurance, you're writing it, you put that sucker in an envelope, and you may only get somewhere here in Virginia. But where if you have a claim and you file it, you say to the insurance company, you owe me some money, and the insurance company, if they finally say, yeah, we're going to pay you, they can mail that check from the other side of the country. So if that check is in the mail for at least two more days, that's two more days, that money is staying in the checking account or the interest before you actually get hold to it. But they can tell you checks in the mail. Even if they've got a payment processing center that's next door to you, they're going to ship it out to the one on the other side of the country. That's what they do. Speed up when they get money from you, slow down when they pay money on your behalf. That's what they do. And one of the best things they're going to do, they have the incentive to not pay your claims. You call to say you got sick. You get well, let's just use car insurance. Let's talk automobiles for a minute. You get in a wreck. Your car is torn up. So you got five thousand dollars damage done to your car, and you can say, "Well, I need my five thousand dollars. I need to fix my car so I can get back on the road again." What are they going to do? Have any of you ever been in an accident? How long did it take before the insurance company paid? Driving with this podcast. Oh, okay. um, that wasn't your accident. Okay. It takes a while. But what's the first thing they do is they try to figure out is it your fault? Or was it somebody else's fault? If you were in an accident and if Matthew's in an accident, Matthew. Oh, okay, look, look, okay, look, look, sorry. Wait, Matthew crashes into Will. Will has insurance from the insurance company, but Will's insurance companies could say, uh, no, it was Matthew's fault. We ain't paying. 
Well, you want your car fixed? It was not on Hub Does. It's up to Matthew's Insurance Company. You talk to them. And if they give you a hard enough time, give us a call and we'll see if we can help. But you've got to get his insurance company to pay for your fixed car because it's his fault. But what is Matthew's insurance company going to do? They're going to try to say, no, it wasn't Matthew's fault. It was Will's fault, so we don't have to pay. And that's just what they do. If they can lay the blame on somebody else, they're going to lay the blame on somebody else, or somebody else has to pay for it. And they'll try to lay the blame on yourself, on you. When you get sick, why did you get sick? Is it your fault? Did you violate the terms of whatever? Did you tell us that you did not smoke, and then you ended up getting lung cancer from smoking? You lied to us. Oops, we ain't paying. Did you tell them that you, you check the box saying, I don't drink? And I think that I talked about this earlier this semester. But you check the box saying, I don't drink, but then, you know, you've got some DUIs on your record. Like I said, you get in a drunk driving accident or whatever. Ooh, you lied to us. Life insurance pays if you die unexpectedly. You commit suicide. That ain't unexpected if you made that choice. They don't pay. They're going to find any excuse to not pay your claim. They have that incentive because the less that they pay out, the more they keep. If they pay $5,000 to fix Will's car, that's $5,000 less profit they have, right? And maybe they'd rather, instead of paying $5,000 on his, to fix his car, they'll pay a lawyer a couple thousand to fight it. Paying a lawyer $2,000 is cheaper than paying Will $5,000, right? That's what they do. And they try to do things to get people to reduce their number of claims. Your health insurance has things. They have programs. They try to encourage you. To go. You get a discount on gym membership because you have our, well, I think I've got that list. Yeah. They'll do things like, we do discount on gym membership. Because that's just how much we love you. Wrong. Because if you go to the gym and you work out, you're going to be healthier. You're less likely to have a heart attack. You end up at us having to pay $50,000 to get you put back together again. So, you know, yeah, the fact that you end up being healthier, well, you know, that's just sort of the bonus, but they don't really care. They just don't want to have to pay. So better to pay, you know, get you discount on a gym membership. They pay $100 for you gym membership each year. That's a whole lot less than paying $50,000 to fix your heart attack. Uh, they'll do this stuff, little rewards things where you go in and you log in and you do healthy stuff and that kind of stuff. They'll send you a water bottle or a gym bag or some crap like that every two, three months, that kind of stuff. Try to incentivize you to eat healthier, be healthier, that kind of stuff. They'll do that. That's reward programs for healthy behavior. They'll do things. Um, Farm Bureau insurance. Any of y'all? Farm Bureau insurance for your car? Y'all that know your parents covered. Oh, when you were 16. Did you do that safe driving, whatever, same thing program? Did they still? Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Okay. Maybe some of your other insurance companies, because I know Josh, when he came through, they had this thing about Josh signed his pledge that he wouldn't drive fast, be the direct, whatever, whatever, whatever. And if he went two years from 16 to 18, if he didn't get in an accident or didn't get a ticket in two years, they would be getting like $1,000 savings bond. And if y'all, your insurance has something like that when y'all were 16? Cool. Okay, but that thousand dollar savings bond, it only cost him like 500 to buy it. But guess what? Josh trying to get this thousand dollar savings bond, he drove better, I guess. I hope, maybe, as far as I know. For those two years, he didn't get in an accident, he didn't get a ticket. So, in the insurance company, he didn't get in an accident. We didn't have to pay you thousand dollars to repair a car that he crashed because he didn't know what he was doing. So they will give you some, you can get some incentives, they'll have some stuff like that. What is it that, um, you know, some of the insurance companies, the more years that you go not having an accident, they'll, each year that you go without having an accident, they'll like a percentage off of your premiums, that kind of stuff, to hopefully encourage you to behave a little bit better when you're driving. So it's nice that you end up being healthy and less likely to get killed, but that's not the number one motivation. The number one motivation is to spend a little to avoid paying a lot. The health and wellness program is setting limits to your coverage. You get in an accident, you know, they've got a limit how much you can pay. Uh, they'll do the um, deductible. 
you get in a five thousand dollar accident and you've got a thousand dollar deductible, well, you got five thousand worth of damage to your car. You're only going to pay four thousand for it, right? You got to pay the other one thousand of it, and that's the idea of which I've got it on a later slide. The idea of since you've got this copay, I know Will knows if he gets in an accident, they're not going to pay the full amount to fix his car. So if he gets his best five thousand dollars worth of damage to his car, they're only going to pay four thousand. So for him to fix his car, back, it's going to cost him a thousand dollars out of his pocket. Will you have a thousand dollars? He does. Good on you. If I beat him up at the class, take his wallet. No, don't do that. Um, in case you know, I was recording. Anyway, um, okay. So Will is the exception there. But what if? Will, they had to think 100% replacement cost. You crash your car and we're going to replace it. What motivations do you have to drive safe? What do I care? As long as I don't get myself hurt, let me go to drive this car and see what happens. I'm going to drive a car and I can get to a hill, I can open the door and jump out and watch a bowl and smash into a tree. What do I care? Insurance companies to pay for it, right? But he's not going to do that because if he knows he jumps out of the car and watches the car roll down hill and crash into a tree, it's going to cost him at least $1,000 to get the thing fixed, right? And he didn't want to waste a thousand dollars on this experiment of hey, everybody watch this, right? I think less you earn more than a thousand dollars worth of ad revenue on his YouTube video and filmed it. So that's kind of the thing. They want you to have a dog and hunt there, so they're gonna have equal co pays and stuff there. And they will investigate fraud. If they think that you lied, if they think that you're not telling the truth, they're going to investigate. And trust me, you get in an accident, they're gonna be looking. Even you know. You're driving down the road and you hit a deer. But you're breaking the speed limit, they ain't gonna pay. But they might not pay, depending on how open minded they are. You just, they're gonna, if you say you don't smoke and they catch you smoking, well, you lie to us. We're not gonna pay. You say you're not a drinker and we catch you drinking, we're not going to pay. They will investigate, they will do better, spend a few hundred dollars on a private detective to be leading up to information than to pay you the however many thousands of dollars when something goes wrong. And once they catch you in a lie, you're done. So I think, I, did we talk about insurance earlier this semester in here? This is something about that But so here's the thing. Y'all know, and they will warn you, if, when you fill out the paperwork to get health insurance, if you check the they ask, are you a smoker or you a drinker? If you check no, because you're less likely to get sick, so you're going to have a smaller monthly bill. Right? So you want to check no, I don't smoke, no, I don't drink, you'll get a smaller monthly bill. But guess what? If you do smoke and you don't drink, I mean, you do smoke and you do drink and you check no, and you're just wasting your money because you're not going to pay, because you lied to them. That's fraud. If you don't only drink and you tell them you don't, you lied, that's fraud. You can even go to jail for it, but they certainly aren't going to pay, so they ain't no need for you to get that coverage if you can lie about it. The only way you get away with it is you only do the drinking in the quiet of your home and then hopefully they don't like actually look at your liver while they're right. The other thing they do is insure, increase your premiums after each plane. So if you get in a car wreck, what happens to your insurance bill next month? It's higher. That's what I'm talking about. Because what did I say? Which I've got about a later slide. They pay uh, when they're figuring out how much you're gonna make you pay each month, it's gonna be based on the odds that they're gonna have to pay you and how much are they gonna have to pay. Guess what? You get in a car wreck, well they know you like me to get in a car wreck because you've already proven proven it correct, right? You've already been in a wreck, so then that, that means you're likely to get in a wreck. So the odds of you getting in another wreck is higher than somebody that's never been in a wreck before. So they're going to charge more. You get a speeding ticket. What happens to your car insurance bill? And you go have a speeding ticket. What happened to your insurance? It went up. Why? Because getting tickets is a sign you drive fast, right? And when you drive fast, you are a more likely to get in a wreck, and b probably going to do more damage when you are in a wreck. If you got in a wreck at 40 miles an hour, you're not going to do this amount of damage that you would have done in the same wreck at 70 miles an hour, right? So the expenses, the odds that they're going to have to pay out because you're not a good driver, 
is higher. Any amount they would have to pay out because you're not a good driver is higher because you speed. So, and yes, speed. I am a good driver. I'm a professional driver, but I speed. The moral hazard, this is sort of uh, getting back to the, you need to have, they want you to have a dog in the hunt, because I think I have an individual slide for here. The idea of having a copay. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost Will if he does something stupid with a car, so he shouldn't do something with a car, stupid with a car. Because we're not going to completely make him all. It's going to cost you, your house burns down. They're not going to fully replace your house. You're, you get sick, you have a heart attack, you get lung cancer. Like It's going to cost you. Your your copay and that kind of stuff. When you go to the hospital, you got to pay five, ten thousand dollars for that fifty thousand dollars worth of surgery. You only got to pay five or ten, but how many of you all got that kind of money that you want to give to the doctor? Just go ahead and give it to the doctors to stay healthy, right? So they'll do this by trying to get you to share in some of the out-of-pocket expenses, and that puts on you the second step of moral hazard is. It's trying, it, it, it's putting responsibility on your shoulders to prevent these things from happening. Because you know, if I drive fast, I'll get in a wreck, so I should drive slower. I know if my house burns down, it's going to cost me. So I need to do things to help limit the odds that my house is going to catch fire and limit the damage that happens when my house does catch on fire. It does catch on fire, but it's dramatically correct. So what can we, what do they want? Fire alarms, smoke detectors, that kind of thing inside your house. You'll get a lower monthly bill on your house, homeowner's insurance, if you have smoke detectors in the house. Because as soon as that fire starts, pretty quick after that fire starts, that thing's going to beep, beep, beep. The humans are getting it out of the house. The fire park is called that way sooner, so the damage is less. So the amount they have to pay out is cheaper. So some companies have made things new to fire that smoke detectors. Some insurance companies will give you a child a car seat. Because better to spend hundred dollars on a car seat than have to cough up in thousands and thousands of dollars in case the junior gets hurt in a car wreck. But they will try to do things to give you the incentive, whatever, to try to do things to take care of yourself. Keep people from like Will to say, hey y'all, watch this. I got full 100 percent replacement coverage on my house. So let's see how many times I can flick a cigarette into the curtains before the house catches on fire, right? I'll stay away from Will. So a uh, definitional definitionally. I don't think that's actually word, but uh, in case y'all aren't really familiar with insurance, but apparently y'all aren't. Uh, a co-payment, that's the amount that you have to pay out of your pocket each time you go to the doctor. When you go to the doctor with a cold and you got to get twenty dollars to the receptionist before you, the doctor goes back and starts treating you, that's your copay. Your premium is that monthly payment you have to send to the insurance company for your coverage. If you don't pay for coverage, they ain't gonna insure you. Just like nobody, the lottery commission ain't gonna give you money if you only bought a ticket, right? Same here. If you ain't paying, you ain't playing. So you got to pay money each month to get the coverage. And the idea here is you're spreading out that expense over time. Yeah, you may spend $100, $200 a month. Let's say it's $300 a month for a year, that's $3,600. So 10 years, that's $36,000. 20 years, that's $72,000 that you spent on health insurance over the next 20 years. But it's spread out over 20 years. Well, what would happen if you didn't do that and suddenly you had a fifty thousand dollar bill that showed up right now, wacko? And how many of you have fifty thousand dollars floating around? You know, so what do you do? You got to borrow money, and then you took out a loan in order to pay for this heart procedure. And what ends up happening? That loan is going to accrue interest month after month for about however many twenty years it's going to take you or more to pay it back. You end up paying back a whole lot more. Keep the insurance. The way they, I already talked about this, the way they figure out how much you're going to have to pay each month is based on the odds they've got to pay and how much they would have to pay. Connor and his twin brother, they're the same age, they're both dudes, they both live in the same area, drive off. Connor's brother, what's your, what's your brother's name? Tommy. Tommy. 
wait, Connor's twin brother, Tommy, is driving around in a $45,000 Lexus. Connor is driving around in a $4,000 Kia. What are the odds that Connor is going to get into a wreck compared to the odds that Tommy is going to get into a wreck? The odds are about the same. They're same age, they live in the same area, they're driving around in the same place, and that kind of stuff. But if Connor gets into a wreck, what's the most that the insurance company is going to end up paying for him? $4,000, right? He's driving around in a piece of junk car. What would, how much would they have to pay to fix Tommy's car? Potentially up to, what is it, 45000 So what, what's, who's going to have the higher insurance bill? Tommy would. Because he's got a more valuable car that's going to cost more money to get it fixed than Connor does. So Connor will have a lower monthly premium on his, help, on his car insurance than his brother Tommy would. But Connor's driving around in $4,000 Kia. Connor's twin sister, what is her name? Casey. Casey. Connor's twin sister, Casey, also is driving a $4,000 Kia. So if she gets it right, fix the $4,000 car. If he gets it right, fixing $4,000 car. Who's going to have the higher insurance? Premium? Connor will. Because Connor's a dude, right? And us guys are more likely to do something stupid that we not have to do. I guess it's the finance class the other day. Maybe even here. Yeah, talk about life expectancy. We do stupid things. We're men. It's just what we do. It's in our DNA. The odds that Connor should be driving fast is higher than Casey. The odds that Connor's going to go drag racing on a Friday night is higher than the odds that Casey's going to go drag racing. The odds that Connor's going to be doing donuts in the icy parking lot are higher than the Casey would. So what ends up happening? If you look, ladies, y'all's car insurance premiums are lower than a comparable Hey, my girlfriend's paying seventy five dollars. Hey, my girlfriend. There you go. Well, basically the same. Here's Sam. Uh, she has an S ten. I have a the same here. Okay, an S ten and a Ranger comparable vehicles in your insurance. How much do you say? One hundred forty. double hers, and they live in the same area, driving virtually the same vehicle. It's just good. Now, once she, once the, the guy hit 26, the insurance companies kind of decided at that point we've grown up. We don't we haven't grown up until we're 26. So at that point, once she hit 26, your car insurance premiums will get a lot closer to being equal. But right now, ladies, your car insurance premiums each month is lower. Now, and, oh, a, a, a girl that's been in an accident, her premium might be the same as a dude that has not been in an accident, right? But hers from being in an accident is still going to be lower than the dudes that has been in an accident. Across the board, the lady's insurance is going to be cheaper because the lady is less likely to do something stupid. It's not as often that the lady says, hey, everybody watch this, right? Hey, everybody watch this. What do you mean? Put it on Facebook. YouTube. Yeah, this All right. So that's how they calculate the premium. So if you want to know, what the insurance company thinks about you, that like life insurance or health insurance, compare how much you have to pay to how much somebody else has to pay for the exact same coverage. If uh, Bobby and Sam both live in the same town and they both want a million dollar life insurance policy from the same company and the insurance company says, okay, Bobby's going to cost you $200 a month. Sam is going to cost you $400 a month. What are they thinking? The odds are a whole lot higher that Sam is going to be dying a whole lot sooner than Bobby. That changes based on where you live, where you work, all that kind of stuff. Uh, car insurance is cheaper out here in the middle of nowhere than it is living in the big city. Because you're more likely to get into a wreck in the big city. Well, luckily those wrecks usually are just much damage because you're in a big city, so you're not driving 80 miles an hour like we do out here in the country. But there's difference in there. So, unless you're on Pennsylvania. Or maybe you're watching George Washington Parkway. I 
digress. Side of speaking today. So that, is, that is kind of is something you can sort of look at because they look at how much we can pay and then uh, what's it going to cost us. Do you just look at insurance tables and you see you know, life insurance premium for a 45 year old woman compared to life insurance premium for a 25 year old woman and you get a picture of what are the odds that a woman is going to 45 is going to die compared to the 25? Just flat out. I mean, that's just, and they have, have you heard the term actuary table? You mean? They don't talk about it, but, it, but insurance companies, they, back in the day, they had a big new chunk and notebook or whatever, but they've got tables of stuff. What are the odds that somebody's going to die? And it's based on age, gender, do they smoke, do they drink, yada, yada, whatever, whatever. You, heart disease and blood pressure running in the family and all this kind of stuff, stuff, stuff. They've got this kind of grid thing, thing, and this goes there, and it's going to calculate. Like, we think Sam's going to die within the next five years. But we think Bobby's going to die. It's going to take 10 years for Bobby to die. So here's the thing. I'm sure I got it here. Yes. Ooh. Uh, Bob. What they're going to do is they say, Bobby wants a million dollar life insurance policy. And they're doing a math and they think Bobby's going to, odds are he's going to live 10 years, 10 more years. So what they're going to do is they're going to say, you want a million dollars? Divided by 10 years, that's $100,000. So that's what your yearly premium is going to be. And so then you're going to do 100000 and then they're going to, so if they get 100000 out of Bobby for the next 10 years, what happens? They got a million out of Bobby, right? So they get a million out of Bobby, and if he dies after 10 years, well, they pay the million back, they broke even. But if Bobby beats the odds and he lives 11 years, he just made ten thousand dollars profit off of it. If he beats the odds and lives eleven years or twelve years or thirty, they they want Bobby to keep living and keep paying in. They want him to beat the odds because the more he beats the odds, the more money they collect from him. This is a starting point for figuring it out. But I'm not like, what, what's the life expectancy of people think? They're gonna say the life expectancy of somebody in Bobby's condition is ten years. Which means half of the people like Bobby are gonna live. More than 20 years, half of them are going to live less than 20 years. And so that's where they're coming I mean, 10 years. Right. Yeah. And so that's where they're going to target. Now, when it's, some, it's, if we had a bunch of clones of Bobby in here, some of them are going to be dying in the next couple of years, some of them are going to live 20 years. But if you averaged out that whole group, they're going to live 10 years on average. So we're going to chip. So a million dollars a piece divided by 10. 100,000, well, we got to tack on a little bit extra on top of that and make up our fees and that kind of stuff along the way, All right? So that's the starting point for where insurance premium is going to get calculated. And you can get insurance by just about anything. Have y'all ever heard of Lloyd's of London? Oh. Uh, y'all know the NCAA National Championship, halftime. They bring out some, some dude that they randomly drew from some kind of contest, Dr. Pepper, you make it a half court shot and give you a million dollars. You think Dr. Pepper's sitting there with an envelope that's like got a million dollars in there? No. What they do is they've got Lloyds of London, an insurance company, who's going to sit there and say, okay, what's the odds that some skinny little white dude's going to come in cold off of the bench, halftime in the middle of a game, and hit his first shot? So they can say there's a 3% chance that he's good. we're going to have to pay out a million dollars. So a million dollars, 3% of that, $9.03 is 30000 So the NCAA, or Dr. Pepper, pays $30,000 a year as a marketing expense. Because, because what Dr. Pepper, what the Lloyds of London is figuring is, well, odds are, you know, we're only going to have to pay this one out of every 30 times. And so we'll make some money, so they'll, they'll charge Dr. Pepper a little bit more than 30000 But so, but that's the starting point. But Dr. Pepper's just like, well, we just have this marketing expense, 30000 30000 30000 year after year after year. It's just a marketing expense, so we don't have this shot of, well, we pay nothing, we pay nothing. Oh, crap, we paid a million dollars a year. And that might be enough to make us really profitable to losing money this year. So they, the Dr. Peppers can spread it out over however much time, buying the insurance policy, Lloyd's of London, this going to be. So then what's Dr. Pepper? Well, we're covered. We've paid our 30000 So what do they want this little thing to do? 
No, Dr. Pepper wants you to make it. They're fine with it. Well, almost. They're almost fine with him making it. Because, dude, you just collected a million dollars. We, Dr. Pepper, look fantastic. And it only cost us $30,000 that year. That year. And then, of course, what's Lloyd's Atlanta going to do? They're, they're going to like, well, apparently the odds of skinny little white dude making that shop afterwards is higher than we expected. So next year when Dr. Pepper wants to sponsor the contest, it's going to cost them a little bit more than 30000 But that's, but that's, that's the way insurance works. Fire insurance, health insurance, life insurance, all of it. What are the odds they're going to have to pay and how much are they going to have to pay? That's the starting point for your coverage because they want to make money off of everybody. They want Bobby to live long enough to where he's paid them more than they paid him. Right? But then also adding along the whole thing about the well, the other thing we do is and what maybe we can use it to lower our maybe we should charge them ten thousand dollars a year. But we're not going to charge them price ten thousand dollars a year because we know that the way we are with our investigators and that kind of crap, we're only gonna end up actually paying out half of the time. So all, uh, for all of those Bobby clones that we had in here, you know, we're probably only going to have to really pay out a million dollars on half of them because we're going to blame them for their situation at least half of the time, right? So then they can lower that whole whole pool of how much they have to pay. So then maybe each each Bobby clone only has to pay like five thousand, six thousand, or something like that. That's the way they work things. The insurance company pays a million dollars. Um, I already talked about this. More likely, the insurance company is going to have to pay on your behalf the higher your premiums. The more often you get in a wreck, the higher your insurance is going to be. The more often you go to the hospital, the higher your health insurance is going to be. The more often you die, the higher your living. So the more off, the quicker people in your family die off. The more often you go to the hospital for health care issues, the more likely you are to die younger. So there's going to be less years that you can be paying them before they're going to have to pay your life insurance premiums are going to be going up. The odds, the more likely they have to pay, the higher your premiums. So this should encourage you to quit smoking, quit drinking, eat vegetables. Eat vegetables. So vegetables. Concept of in network providers. I talked about the other day how doctors kind of negotiate for great thing. Was that this last or this? Finance class. Poor Kerry, he's in like all three of my student classes this semester, and it just it all it blurs together for me and blurs together for him. So, so is, that does ring any bells. Yeah. Yes. Not a good one. <laughs> uh, doctors negotiating group prices for discount. Okay. So, I, well, I, well, I think I talked about this at the end of class the other day about when I was telling you to get your own health and make sure you have health insurance. Because if, well, I think I was picking on Josie. She gets sick or whatever. She doesn't have insurance. She's got to pay the full bill and she might. She's a good person. She's going to pay over the next 20 years. So the doctor is going to get $20 a month for the next however many years from Joseph. And that's kind of, you know, that's kind of annoying to the doctor. So the doctors will negotiate this deal with the health insurance companies. Well, generally the health insurance company, they sort of come up with you. This is the plan if you want to get on board with it, with the kind of negotiation to where the you be in our network. Well, instead of us, instead of us paying you the full one hundred percent, well, we'll pay y'all sixty percent, but you get your money right now. That that kind of thing. So the doctors are okay with that because maybe Joseph pays. It's gonna take her twenty years to pay off her money. Meanwhile, there's a bunch of other people that get sick and don't have insurance and don't pay a penny. So better to get sixty percent from the insurance company than to get one hundred percent from one out of five people spread out over twenty years, right? So, basically, it's a group bulk pricing thing for the insurance. The insurance companies are fine with that because they're going to be charging you more than they're going to be paying the doctors, right? 
And the less they pay the doctors, then the less they can charge you for your premium. So you're more likely to become their customer, give them money, and they hope for you to stay healthy, right? Because if they told you tomorrow your health insurance is going to cost you three thousand dollars a month, how many of you are going to get health insurance? Crap, no. That would pretty much be way too much my paycheck. That would be most of my paycheck. I don't know. You'd have to ask my wife, but that would be most of whatever I know. Um, so I mean, so people would be like, uh, "Screw it, I'm gonna take a chance," right? So the insurance companies they gotta try to keep their premiums down. So one way that they can do that is to lower how much they pay to the doctors. And the way they do that is a to try to encourage y'all to live healthier, keep healthier, and all that kind of stuff that they do that we talked about a few minutes ago. And the other thing is negotiating these bulk discount rates. So why don't some like health insurance companies actually pay like dieters and stuff. Yes, you can uh, diet, diet, dietitian. We'll go with that word. Uh, even you get discounts on going to Weight Watchers. This kind of thing. They may even pay you to go to Weight Watchers. That's the thing. Uh, like I said, they'll pay you some of them do gym membership discounts. So you can. Uh, they they've got programs. If you've got health insurance, check and see what kind of programs they may have. Some of them. They'll help you pay for something that you're already doing. But the idea is, is we negotiate with people that ain't go to doctor, not Dr. Pepper, Dr. Ben. Okay. So Dr. Ben is in the network. So we've negotiated a deal with Dr. Ben. So when Loveline gets sick, Loveline, go to Dr. Ben. So we've negotiated this deal with him. So we don't have to pay so much. But Loveline's like, I really like Dr. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Who, whoops, let's talk a little about that one. Uh, so she's like, I really like Dr. Who. You don't do that. Anybody? Dr. Who. Oh, so, um, but Dr. Who's not in the network. So the insurance company doesn't want her to go to Dr. Who. They want her to go to Dr. Ben because they don't have to pay as much to go to Dr. Ben as they would if she goes to Dr. Who. So they tell Loveline, well, he's not in our network. Uh, you can go to Doctor Who. We'll have to pay more if you go to Doctor Who. But guess what? You'll have to pay more too. If you go to Doctor Ben, maybe you don't have to pay a penny to go to the visit. If you go to Doctor Ben, you know, maybe you only have to pay twenty dollars. If you go to Doctor Who, you got to pay fifty dollars at the door and twenty percent of the total cost of the procedure. Where if you go to Doctor Ben, you pay your twenty dollars. And maybe five percent of the total cost to try to give her the incentive. You're gonna. It's gonna cost you a whole lot more out of your pocket to go to Doctor Who. But you sure you want to go to Doctor Who instead of Doctor Ben, who is one of our fantastic network doctors that we looked at and we talked with and we can trust them because they're reputable. Yeah, yeah, all that All right. So that's the insurance company. Yeah. Well, it's. It, if you're going to get a insurance policy that says you can go to any doctor on a planet and we cover all of it, well, it ain't going to cover all of it. You still got to do your twenty dollar copay or whatever, whatever. But if you just find a policy that says any doctor anywhere, anytime, we pay it all. You got to do is pay twenty bucks. It's going to cost you crap ton of your premiums each month. Um, There's something that I was thinking. So we talked about the other day, we'll let the government do it. In here. So it, it ultimately, the, the doctors are basically going to be government employees because the government's going to set a, a schedule of this is how much we're going to pay for these different procedures. This is all we're going to pay for these different procedures. So this is, and so we're paying, this is all you can charge us for. So you got to keep your costs below this level. Yeah. It's, it's good in some ways, and maybe not so good in some ways. Um, let's see, who may carry? I don't think I picked on you yet today. You may be it. So, if Karen 
socialized medicine, he gets in an accident or something, whatever, and he goes to the doctor, and, okay, he, he broke a leg. And he's on Medicare, and Medicare says, well, we'll pay $5,000. $5,000 for leg, $8,000 for a neck, $3,000 for an arm, you know, they've got a schedule of what they would pay. So Dr. Dr. Ben, when you treat Carrie, you need to make sure that you don't spend more than $5,000, because if you spend more than $5,000, well, we're paying you $5,000, you're gonna lose money treating Carrie. Carrie doesn't care because he ain't gotta pay anything. He just has to limp into the hospital. But what's Dr. Ben gonna do? He's gonna start saying, well, do we really need this treatment? Do we really need to do an x-ray? Do we really need to do an MRI? There would be the tendency to reduce quality of care. And so that's kind of the danger side of things. The quality of care generally isn't as good in these countries that have a socialized medicine, and that's why you know, I talked the other day about it. You have people from other countries that come to the United States if they got a serious illness going on because they want to get the best treatment there is, and that's here. Because there, not so much. The, the doctors are government employees. True story. This is true. The doctors are government employees. Their hourly salary, uh, like in England. And so you're sitting there and they're operating on you and they got your guts all spread out and that kind of stuff. And then the surgeon's sitting there working and all that kind of stuff. And then one of the surgical assistants is like, uh, it's noon, y'all. No, oh, really? Okay. Oh, let me set my needle here, set my horse up here, take a little blue drape, lay it across the person's chest, and okay, we'll be back in an hour. And then they go down the street, you know, leave the hospital, go down the street, eat lunch, maybe have a pint, depending. Come back. Come back in, okay, it's one o'clock, you can scrub up, scrub up, and you can pull the blue drape up, and okay, you can eat oil, okay, where were we? That's your deal with search life medicine. You get hurt, they're gonna, it's kind of, okay, you're on a waiting list. Y'all get sick or y'all get something going on, y'all can get treated in a matter of hours here in the United States. But um, my wife, a friend of her mother's, was in Israel. And Alice was old. She, an old lady, okay, and she ended up in the old part of town, whatever, stairs in there or whatever. She fell downstairs and broke a leg or the ankle, something, and ultimately needed surgery on because she's old. I mean, old. So, old lady falls, breaks an ankle. How long would it take for her to be treated here in the United States? Alice was there at least two weeks before she got treated. I mean, sort of bandage her up, whatever, and when we can schedule you in for surgery, we will schedule you in for surgery. A couple of mercenary sisters ended up flying over to Israel to help take care of Alice for a couple of weeks while she was waiting to get operated on. And there was socialized medicine. Socialized medicine. Yeah, they cost Alice any money out of her pocket to get treated. Cost her two weeks of broken leg. Cost her a couple extra weeks with her broken leg is swelling up and she can't do anything except try to hop around because she held legs and keep her in her car. She certainly can't hop back downstairs to get out there to do anything. That's that's what socialized medicine brings to the table here. The doctors are going here in America. We and, and that's it. But to, not to completely bash socialized medicine, say free market. Yeah. Carrie gets a broken leg, and the doctor's like, you know, that bone almost protruded out of the skin or whatever. Maybe we need to run this extra test just to make sure that you're not going to end up, it didn't poke something that it on its way through, and make sure you're not getting gangrene or something like that. Let's run this extra test. What do you think? I said, I really think we need to do an MRI on this. What's Carrie going to say? Yeah, better be safe than sorry. Right? And that's what we say here in America. Better to be safe than sorry. Give me that extra test just to be sure. Because I want to make sure I get the best care I can. Because Kerry, he trusts his doctor, right? How many of you trust your doctor? Every one of you. Doctors have about the highest favorability rating in the United States of any profession, any group, period. Doctors rate higher than religious people, like preachers and the moms and that kind of thing. Doctors rate. How many of you go to a bad doctor? How many of you doctors below average? How many of you doctors average? How many of you go to one of the best doctors in town? 
Okay, Danielle, raise your hands. We all think we go to one of the best doctors in town. We all can't go to the best doctors in town because one of those best doctors in town has to be the worst doctor in town, right? So Carrie is going to a doctor that he trusts, that he thinks is real good, that he thinks that yeah, I trust you, doc, that's why I'm going to you instead of any of the other docs. And you think that I need to get this thing checked, run a second test, just to be sure. Better to be safe than sorry. So yeah, they're gonna run an MRI on his leg even though the bone didn't actually pierce the skin. Yep. What are the odds that there was an infection? Maybe one percent, two percent, but better to be safe than sorry, right? So the mentality here is take that extra test, do that extra treatment. Where in the countries where they're socializing that, so maybe we get extra stuff. He didn't, did you really need an MRI? Did it, the hospital really need to spend another $8,000 on something on the 2% chance that they might find something? In statistics, we call that statistically insignificant. And y'all think it says, for information? Okay, so y'all know that phrase, right? Or have y'all gotten that part yet? R squared, all that kind of stuff. And the P values and that kind of thing. Okay. Coming soon, we'll play the right one day is last day. Good. Well, coming soon, next semester, maybe. Well, no, I guess y'all only do one semester stats. Y'all y'all don't y'all haven't got the good stuff yet. Congratulations. What am I committing? So the tendency is to get if the default position here in the United States, get over treatment. The default position in the country to have socialized medicine, get under treatment. Do less. We won't check your leg out. We won't do the MRI. If you've had a problem in a couple of weeks, hobble back in and we'll make an appointment and then you can come back a couple of weeks later and then we'll do the MRI. Maybe it's a month out and hopefully you haven't lost your leg in the meantime. But it's only 2% chance that that's gonna happen, right? That's the difference. The tendency to do the wait and see versus the let's take care of it now. How many of you ever had to get your car fixed? Okay. There's two kinds of mechanics out there. There's some mechanics that you bring the car in and they're like, okay, you know, I'm going to try something. You know, I, 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 I did this thing, fix it, you drive it for a few days, whatever, still messed up, bring it back. I'm only going to charge 50 bucks. Where the other one is, oh, okay, they're going to keep your car for two, three days, you're going to go over with a fine tooth comb, and I fix this, I fix this, I fix this, I fix this, give you $400. Which kind of mechanic would you rather go to? The one that's like, well, let's try this. If it don't work, bring it back. We'll try something else. If it don't work, bring it back. We'll try something else. If it don't work, bring it back. We'll try something else. Versus me, I went over it. I know I've got the problem solved. Which mechanic do you prefer? The try this, try that versus the get her done. Get her done is the healthcare system we have in the United States. The try this, try that kind of mechanic is socialized medicine. And then you should just say, but I, I, I used to go to mechanic because that way you try something and you like, go, okay, I think I got it. It's running right now. And then three days later, my truck is messed up again. I'm like, really? I'm like, I ain't got time to be sitting there bringing my truck back to every week or two. And try this, try it. Well, I'm doing, you know, I'm trying to save some money. You go, I only have to pay $20, $30, $50, so multiply by how many times we actually fix the problem. And then I had to, how many days did I not have my truck? Just shut up and find a problem and fix the thing. That's the same. But you didn't live that far away from me. Uh, I'm literally blanking on his first name. Oh, Cox was the last name. Anyway, I digress. But psychologically, that's what's going on. So, y'all with me? So, uh, that was the last slide for that. So, let's just end on a slightly different note. So, let me present. Yeah. Don't make me sign in, you Oh, did I hit the wrong button? Okay. So, let's wrap things up. They only had my job. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> be on a 50 yard line, they missed the guy. <laughs> Liking white cookies. They're kind of rude. Oh, 
don't know, maybe she's head over heels on that. Yes. You work for science, so you should be familiar with it. Watermelon. <laughs> yes. A watermelon. Why don't you get a little DVD the other watermelons all stuck together on something? Uh -huh. Yes. I'm driving along and I don't know if it's a pee that starts laying on me. Yeah, spill your hot coffee on your lap. That's what that is. Or that's what that is.